Evan Horton said, good leaders know where they are and where they're headed. And we've been in this series of this is who we are for this last little while. And we're wrapping it up uh, today for now and moving forward. And I've spent a little bit of time and we've talked about becoming powerful people. We've talked about becoming powerful church. And today I'd like to talk about our roadway to success and how we're going to manage that. So let's pray and then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love for us. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to give us wisdom and discernment as we journey together in your name. Amen. Well, uh, in Proverbs chapter 4, 5 to 7, or 25 to 27, it says this, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. Don't swerve to the right or to the left or to, and turn your foot away from evil. A little while back, I shared with you how we were in a journey, how our journey has been going, that we were journeying from Isaiah 60 to Isaiah 61, the, from arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, to Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us because he's anointed us to preach good news. Recently, a, a friend of mine uh, uh, had a prophetic word, and, and he said, Landon, I see over the church, I see this, this, this bent piece of metal and and it looks like it's being shaped into something but I don't know what it is and I was I was asking the Lord what does this mean and he and then the Lord reminded him of two scriptures where it says beat your plowshares into swords or beat your swords into plowshares both are prophetic both are 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 uh, um, uh, talk about times and seasons the one being where you're beating your plowshares into swords like where, where you're going from growth to taking ground or the other from from taking ground to in, in or growth, you know, from you know, men farming, as it were, and, and managing where you're at. And he said, does that mean anything to you? And I said, absolutely it does. We're beating our plowshares into swords. We're in that season right now where we're moving from cultivating what we have here to actually moving into taking it to our community and beginning to affect our community. And, and so I, I'm, in, I'm a firm believer that we're in that transition now where we're moving away from simply being a family, but being an activated family to touch our community. Can somebody say amen? So when we talk about journeying into being a powerful church, I spent some time out of Matthew chapter 16 where it says, uh, you know, where, where Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you're Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, here's the thing, my friends, is that, is that he's not saying, Jesus wasn't saying he was building the church on Peter. He was building the church. He's building the church on Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Furthermore, gates are not offensive weapons. No army goes out into the battlefield with gates to, you know, like open them on everybody, right? Gates are, <laughs> gates are defensive weapons. The scripture says this, that when a strong man fully armed guards his possessions, they're safe. But when somebody stronger than him comes, strips him of the armor on which he relied, he can go in and plunder his goods. What's this mean? It means that Satan is often viewed as the strong man in Scripture when he's, when he's spoken of this way. Satan, when he is fully armed with his armor, can guard his possessions. But when somebody stronger than him comes and strips him of the armor on which he relied, this is the important part. See, gates are defensive. Armor, armor is defensive. The enemy depends upon the defenses that he creates amongst us so that he can hold us back. He doesn't have, we often think that the enemy is on the move with his offensive weapons. He's not. What he's doing is he's tricking, he's deceiving, he's lying to get people to step into what, what he would call his strongholds, his armor, his protection. But I've got good news. Somebody stronger has come. His name is Jesus. He's stripped the enemy of all of the armor on which he's relied, and we can plunder his goods. In other words... We don't even have to break down the gates. Oh, tell them I'm busy. We don't even have to break down the gates. The gates are broken for us. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The kingdom of God is meant to move forward. It's meant to touch this community. And we are the agents of that kingdom. So when I talked about the ecclesia, the error, the ecclesia, the, the, the called out ones, we're not called in, we're called out. <laughs> Can you receive that, my friends? 
We tend to look at our, at our Christian existence about, oh, I, you know, I'm in church, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, and we're actually meant to be out. We're meant to be called out. We gather in so that we grow. We gather in so that we have an opportunity to be coached, to be mentored, to be developed. We gather in so that we learn about ourselves, we learn about our gifts, we learn about our opportunities, our anointings, but that, that's all meant so that we go out. No play is really going to be successful if it's executed from the perspective of being in the huddle. The quarterback can't throw in the huddle. The receiver can't catch in the huddle. Nobody's going to run in the huddle. We move out and we execute the play. We come here weekly so that we can grow, that we can develop, so we can go out and execute the play. I was sharing earlier um, about, you know, that, that, that counselor dragging the, the, uh, his... his uh, barf bag behind him um, and 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 just when when we were at when we were at the ranch one of the things that that I would have to encourage the staffers on the team on is is to learn how to engage a power a, a supernatural element of energy and I think a lot of times what we do as Christians is we just try to make it from Sunday to Sunday and and, and it's just like you know oh God I, I know it's Monday but Jesus just help me get to Sunday like I just need to be in your presence I just need to, you know I just need I just need a word like and, and then even even the the coming in on Sunday morning oh pastor I need a word like I just need a word can I give you a word go get Get one. Get your own word. <laughs> God wants to have depth in relationship with you. He wants to have impact. He wants to have intimacy. He wants to equip you. Go get your own word. Learn to get your own stuff. See, here's the thing. In, in Exodus, the challenge was given to the children of Israel. Go out daily with, and gather an omer of manna. And that will be for your day. Don't gather extra. Don't try to save it. Gather for what you need for that day. And then the next day, go out and gather it again. But of course, what some of them did is they went and gathered extra, and they kept the extra overnight, and it began to stink, and it was filled with worms the next morning, and the Lord was angry with them. What's the point? The point is this, is that we daily gather our manna, and then what we need to do is learn to spend it, like spend it all. I would tell the staff, go get your manna and spend it all today. Give everything that you have to those kids. Give all the energy you've got. Listen, there, there, there's a tendency for us to look at relationships. There's a tendency for us to look at our lives like a, a withdrawal. Like we find places where we get deposits and then we spend the rest of our life or the rest of our time in withdrawal. And I'd like to submit to you that we should live actually sowing and reaping. In the morning, reaping what God has laid out before us and then spending the rest of our day sowing it all. Giving it all. With no fear, with no regret, with no concern, but living our lives to the fullest in front of the world so that we can sow out the, the, the wonder and the nature and the goodness of God so that they experience it. Because that's where you're going to discover the supernatural energy, the supernatural provision that God has for your inner man to be able to change the world. Landon, wow. Well, you're welcome. Anytime. Just, you know, I'll cheer myself on. I'm good. I'm good. I've got me. Okay. Talk about becoming a powerful church. I, I, shared, I shared with you also about being powerful people. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. There was a, there was a doctrine that went around for a while that said you were kings or priests, where there's the, 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 the desire to separate the pulpit from the marketplace. And I would submit to you today that you're not kings or priests. You're kings and priests. You're meant to walk in wisdom and revelation. You're, the wisdom is, is heaven's solutions to earth's problems. It's heaven being practical. And at the same time, the supernatural, the, the element of revelation, is God's supernatural nature having an intersection with natural condition. Today, God's supernatural nature had an intersection with your natural condition in your back, and it changed. Because that's what the supernatural does. It brings things into its order, not the other way around. Oh, come on. And God's calling us now. He's calling us to actually live our lives in the marketplace as kings. You're meant to walk in that wisdom. You're meant to bring the wisdom of heaven wherever you go. You see, again, when we separate the sacred from the secular, we create this mindset that there's times when I'm sacred and there's times when I'm secular when it's all sacred. It's all meant to bring glory to God. Your entire life is meant to bring glory to God in everything you do. You're meant to walk in the wisdom of heaven, to bring heaven's practice practical solution to earth's problems so that people around you can experience the anointing, the wonder, the goodness of God our Father making life, making life practical, making life real, shifting atmospheres because you're filled with his spirit. 
You're not meant to come up with just a marketing plan. It's meant to be anointed and wise. You're not meant to just come up with a lesson plan. It's meant to be anointed. It's meant to make you the best teacher that those, exper- those students have ever experienced. Are you, getting what I'm, are you getting what I'm saying? But when we live in fear of, of withdrawal, we lose the opportunity to live in power. God wants us to live in the, 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 the fullest life. And frankly, if you fill a, a, a church with powerful people, it's going to become a powerful church. I shared with you how we use our words, belong, discover, follow, thrive, as a pathway, as a, as a metric for us to, to manage how we're growing. Am I, am, I, am I struggling connecting with people? Is there an area in my life where, where I need to respond to the Lord and learn how to belong better? Am I struggling with my connection with him? Are there things in my life I'm allowing to get in the way of my intimacy? And so we move there or discover, is, has God become a little boring? Have we lost our wonder? Have we lost our pursuit of him? Have we lost our adventure in in discovering his nature? Have we gotten a little bit apathetic about that? Or perhaps follow. With follow, we need to understand the metric of have we allowed sin patterns to have authority in our lives? Have we begun to ignore sin patterns and just left them as patterns? This brings us to this next element of Jesus is Lord. I I shared this this morning. I don't know if I shared it very well. I'll try it one more time. But there's this tendency, you know, if we look at some some other cultures, even other religions, they operate in a way that they would never want to offend their deity because they're afraid of them. And so there are behavioral elements in their lives that they would just, they would, look, they would look at Christians and say, I can't believe you do that. We would never do that out of fear of offending our God. But because we have this wonderful Jesus who wants to have an intimate relationship with us, this wonderful Jesus who operates in grace, who operates in forgiveness, who, who wants us to not be afraid of him, but because of that, we've actually lost the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord absolutely respects and understands and adheres to his nature as divine. And because of that, one who operates in the fear of the Lord, which the Bible says is the beginning of wisdom, if you're looking at how to obtain wisdom, it's by walking in the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? That means having an utmost respect for his divine nature and that he's God. And that while I do have an intimate and personal relationship with him, that doesn't negate his positional relationship with me and the rest of the universe, by the way. See, because your relationship to the king doesn't negate the protocol of the king. Your relationship to the king doesn't negate the power of the king or the role or the position of the king. And we have this incredible, incredible privilege to live as intimate lovers of a royal household with all of the benefits of intimacy and all the protocol of royalty. And, that, and that's why it can be attention, but we, 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 we can tend to lose that. Am I making sense? And so sometimes in the follow, the follow element, the follow element of our lives gets robbed because we've lost our fear of the Lord. We've, we've lost the respect for his nature. And we allow sin patterns to have authority. Jesus' is Lord needs to become a lens that the disciple lives their life through. See, because outside of that, we can live compartmentalized. We become consumers. We become individual. We become... We, we become filled with an agenda for our own personal gain. And we miss the power of what God has, and we lose our opportunity to thrive. Because we're not safe for all of heaven's resource to, behind our, to be behind our heart's desires. God wants to give you your desires. God wants you to walk in the fullness of what you're dreaming to walk in. But if your heart isn't fully his, he can't risk putting all of heaven's resource behind that because it'll destroy you. You see, that lack of fear of the Lord is a lack of wisdom. That lack of wisdom will rob you of sustained favor and of a life that, that, that walks in the fullness of his nature and thrives over the long term. Am I making sense? My son lacked wisdom when he was six, but he wanted to drive the car. I, as a discerning father, recognized his lack of wisdom and didn't release him to the full uh, 
impact of being able to drive, you know, to have all of that resource under his foot. That was just me being a gracious father. He felt I was being restrictive. He felt I wasn't being fair. He felt that I was being short-sighted. I, on the other hand, recognized his short-sightedness and saved his life. Are you catching what I'm saying? So we have to, to understand this. So we walked through becoming a powerful church. We walked through becoming powerful people. I shared with you, do you remember? I don't remember if you remember the seesaw. And in becoming a powerful church, how, how a church remains powerless. And, and, and what happens is we have our journey, my journey with the Lordship of Jesus, my journey into belong, discover, follow, thrive. And then when I come into peace there, I could engage consumerism and return back and, and come back into that out of balance state, state and lose my power as a church. But if I take and choose vision, that vision moves us from it being my journey to our journey. You see, it's appropriate for a season for somebody else to set the environment so that you can belong, even before you believe. It's appropriate for a season for somebody else to set the environment for you to discover God. It's appropriate for a season for somebody else to set the environment for you to learn how to follow him, for you to learn how to thrive. It's appropriate for a season for other people to set the stage for you to have a, have, have a platform to launch from, uh, uh, things that you can do so that you can thrive, so you can enjoy and engage the fullness of God's nature. However, there will come a point where it is no longer appropriate for other people to do that for you, because if you remain in that place, that's called consumerism. But if you engage it and become actually a stakeholder rather than a beneficiary, then you begin to help set the environment so that somebody else can belong. You begin to set the environment so that somebody else can discover. You begin to set the environment so that somebody else can follow. And can I suggest to you that in doing that very thing, you actually are living in Thrive. Because the nature of heaven is being released through you. You're experiencing the wonder of God through you, and you're becoming an agent of change rather than just simply a beneficiary of it. For us to become a powerful church, the critical mass has to tip the scales away from it being just simply my journey to our journey. So that we, as a group of people, are committed to creating space for others to belong, for our, for our city to belong, for our city to discover, for our city to follow. That's what has to happen. That's what, what happens. That's why we're talking about the critical mass. So I was saying that people need to engage stakeholder status, partnership status with us, not because we want to pad our stats, but because we're looking for a group of people who are willing to say, I'm in to see disciple, this nation discipled. You know, the, the mission of heaven is to disciple nations. It's not simply to disciple individuals. The mission of Gateway isn't simply to disciple individuals. It's to shift our city. We were set in a city to shift it for the, for the nature of the kingdom. You're meant to live individually, releasing the nature of the kingdom. We're meant to live corporately, extending the nature of this kingdom, this kingdom of heaven that God wants to release here in Leduc, because the kingdom makes a city better. The kingdom principles make the city better. And we can do that. We can do that. By people who've moved beyond simply receiving to giving. So, how, how do we do this? I shared with you last week that we do it through our values. And I'd like to, I'd like to take a minute and, and share a thought on that. So I called this the roadway to success. So, I mean, if you want to imagine a road in front of you with guardrails on the side. I'm sure you've experienced that, seen that when there's guardrails on either side. What's the purpose of the guardrails? Jesus? No, the, the, there's another answer. What's the purpose of, you know, what's the purpose, what's the purpose of the guardrails? Wait, they, they keep you on the road. See, I don't ask questions that are hard to keep you on the road. If you hit a guardrail, it should, it should cause shaking. It should cause irritation. Correct? Well, we've created this pathway through belong, discover, follow, thrive. We've created a roadway. It's a pathway for people to, to engage the kingdom way that we have going on here. It's, it's a pathway. It's a metric for us to manage ourselves as we grow into what God wants. It, it's, a, it's an opportunity. It's a pathway for us. 
And I'd submit to you that our values are like the guardrails that keep us from veering to the right or to the left. And so I want to take just a couple minutes. I want to talk about our value structure. The first one being that we're kingdom minded. Colossians chapter three, verse two and three says this, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We're kingdom minded. It's a broad statement. I realize it's a broad straight statement. Because it requires us to know and learn and develop and mature in the ways of the kingdom. In saying this to you, what I'm saying is that I believe you're not slouches. I believe you don't need to be hand fed. I believe that you don't need to be spoon fed. I believe that you have the capacity because you're filled with Holy Spirit to be searching out the kingdom ways and learning them. Set your minds on the, kings that are, on the things that are above when Paul said that we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, I've talked to you about renew the renewal of the mind, that it's learning what heaven thinks on a thing and making that the truth you live by. So we are kingdom-minded. In other words, there's kingdom principles that we engage as family because we know they work. They're not always our favorite, but we know they work. Forgiveness works. Forgiveness brings freedom. It brings way more freedom than holding on to offense. We know it works. We know generosity works. We know grace works. We know wisdom works. We know worship works. We're kingdom minded. That means this. When we don't know what to do, we lean into what we know. We go back to the, the handbook. We go back to the kingdom and we look for the kingdom principle that we need to apply in this moment because we're kingdom minded people. The kingdom is what Moses, the king's domain, his way is our way. Are you hearing me? We've embraced his way, dare I say, over our way. That's what follow means. The kingdom way works. You see, because what the kingdom does is the kingdom marries the natural and the supernatural wisdom and revelation, and it just works. We're kingdom minded. If you want to stay on the path, if you want to belong, discover, follow, thrive, if you want to, if you want to experience life and life abundantly, the kingdom way works. We're kingdom minded. Our second value is that we're love motivated. John said, I, a new commandment, I, well, Jesus said this through John, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I loved you. You're also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. See, the challenge that we have is to, engage, is to engage the agape love, the God love for one another. The Bible says that the world will know that we're his disciples by our what? Love. We're love motivated. That means that we always look for the way of love in every situation. Listen, justice is good. Truth is good. Order is good. Judgment is even good. But without love, they're destructive. Good things become bad things if they're not done in love. And love also needs to be felt by the other person. If Jenna's love language, let's say Jenna's love language, my love language is gift giving, but her love language is acts of service, let's just say. And so if I come to her and I give her a gift, what I'm doing is I'm loving her by loving me. I'm loving the way I love but I'm not really considering her. Love has to actually be felt by the other person. In a sense, what we do as Christians is we go, you know what I love about you, Jenna? You don't wonder what I love? I love how much me I see in you. You're so much like me. That makes me, it's easier for me to love you. If you would like me to love you more, add more of me to you, and then you'll get more of me. And I'll love you more. Because I love the me I see in you. You see, when, when we love in our way, that, doesn't, that isn't necessarily honoring, is it? If I really wanted to love her and I know that her, her love language is acts of service, I'll serve her. I might not feel the love, but she's supposed to because love has to be felt by the other person. Yeah. It has to be felt by the other person. So it changes the way we, it changes the way we share it. It changes the way we express it. 
challenges us to change that. And the thing about love is that it's about giving, not taking. Well, I just don't feel like anybody's really been loving me very well. I've got great news for you. You've got access to love. It's called God. He is love. Why, you know what, kingdom people don't look temporally for what they need, they look vertically. It's kingdom principle, help keep you on the road. Kingdom-minded person recognizes that it's the vertical input that comes, not the horizontal one that brings life. We're love motivated. Let me just take a minute. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Because 1 Corinthians 13 actually guides us into love. If I speak in the tongue of men and, angel, and men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Can we pause here just for a minute? In other words, giftedness without love has no value. One can operate in one's gift but not be motivated by love, and that gift will hold no value to the individual that you're gifting. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I certainly have experienced loveless prophecy. I've experienced that. I've experienced loveless counsel. People may have been gifted, but they weren't operating in love. Are you following me? Just because you're operating in your gift, it doesn't mean you're loving that person. In a sense, you're just loving the way that you live and expressing it to that person. But if you're, not in sh if you're not determined to make sure that they feel love, then you're missing the boat. Let me just go on here a little bit. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Yes, can we hold the phone here for a second? Sacrifice without love holds no value. You've seen the Hallmark movies. Dad, I don't think you love me. What do you mean I don't love you? I've worked every day. I've sacrificed. I've been out there. I've been away from home slaving so that you could have this, so that you could have that. I've worked so hard for these things. Sacrifice doesn't mean love to someone. Love means love. You might be saying, I'm loving you through my sacrifice. They're saying, I don't care about the sacrifice. I just would actually like you. Are you following me this morning? Let me just go a little further. Love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. See, right here we see how love operates. There it is. If you say, well, I just don't know how to love. There it is. There it is. Be patient. Be kind. Believe all things about somebody. Hope all things for somebody. Well, that, that sounds dangerous. Yes, love is dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. But the good news is spend your manna because God has more than enough available for you. He will always give you what you need in the midst of it. Spend it all. Like, spend it all. Listen, Paul's going to talk to you about being thrifty, and that's fine. Spend it all. Every shekel of, of goodness that God releases to you, spend it all. Give it all away. Love hard. Love dangerously. It's going to hurt. And then he'll come and heal you and make you stronger where it hurts you so that you can even love better later on. He's good. He'll never leave you. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. You know what, you guys? <laughs> I'm going to be out of a job in heaven because there will be no need for preaching. You won't need to be equipped anymore. Got bad news for the evangelists. Everybody in heaven is going to be saved. I got bad news for the prophets. You're not going to need a word from God when God's there. Right? See, he says, faith, hope, and love. Faith is good. 
Not going to be needed up there. Hope is good. Not going to be needed up there. But love will remain. Love will remain. We're love motivated. We're love motivated. And finally, we're family focused. If I can read from Psalm 68, a father to the fatherless, a judge and protector of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God places the solitary into families and gives the desolate homes in which to dwell. God isn't interested in bringing the world into an orphanage, but he wants to bring them into family. And we've worked hard. We've plowed hard to develop family. We've plowed hard to to create space for family, for it to be real, for it to be authentic. But now God is taking our plowshare and it's turning into a sword so that this family can go and bring family to Leduc, to bring family to Edmonton, to bring family to this region so that they can see and experience what family really is, what God's designed family to be, so that they can experience the wonder of that. And then we're changing the game now. God's changing the game for us. And we're going to start to take our city and take what we possess and give it to them. Is there anybody else who'd want to see that happen for Leduc? Anybody else think that family would be a good gift to our city? So we understand that we're family before function. Healthy family establishes identity before activity. It celebrates who you are, not just what you do. It creates safety. It knows how to honor, but doesn't think you're all that big of a deal. Did you hear me? It knows how to honor, but it doesn't think that you're all that big of a deal. In my house, they don't call me Pastor Landon. It bothers me. (laughs) I feel that they could honor me more. But I guess I'm not all that big of a deal. We need that. You You need space where people, you know, aren't so impressed by what you do. But they just love who you are. That's the beauty of family. That's why I want this place to be a place where a millionaire... And somebody who isn't can be at the same pap- be at the same table doesn't really matter. I want a place where the broken and the put together can be together, and neither one feels embarrassed, and neither one looks down on the other. We're just family, just who we are. Got a couple of weird uncles, a couple of weird aunties, several weird aunties. Paul always says, if your family, you know, every family has weird uncles, and if yours doesn't, it's probably your dad. (laughs) I just, I love that one. Says, I I just want to wrap this up. The pathway to becoming a powerful person is found in becoming a king and a priest. It's living in wisdom and revelation. The pathway to becoming a powerful church is moving from your personal journey to a corporate one. And our roadway to success is by simply engaging the values that God has given us to live by. Being kingdom-minded, being love-motivated, and being family-focused. If we can have that be the how we do what we do, we're going to see the kingdom marvelously advance in this community people will get saved and God will be given the glory and our, our city will, will return it better than when we got it. If you're here today and you've never had the opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. You and I were created in the image and likeness of God, but because of sin, we lost that likeness. That Jesus came, he took our sin upon himself so that you and I could be returned to the likeness of God and experience the fullness of heaven. And not only experience heaven here on earth, but also when we perish to experience heaven in his presence. God's design and desire was to have a relationship with you. So he sent his son who died on a cross, rose again from the dead, overcame sin and death, and returned mankind to the opportunity of having the likeness of God returned to them. And if you're here this morning, if you never had a chance to do that, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. So I'm going to look from this side to this side. And if you give me a wave, we'll pray for you and bring you into that life giving relationship with God. Best decision you could ever make is the decision of Jesus.
being your Lord and Savior. So quickly, I'm looking across. Is there anybody here this morning? I recognize most of the faces. Don't scratch your ear. I might save you by accident. Just give me a quick wave. Is there anybody here today? Very well. For those of you who've heard me over the course of this last few minutes, and you're like, Pastor Lennon, I want to walk in these values so that we can see our city change. If that's you, would you stand with me? Go ahead, quickly. Lift both hands in the air and just declare this out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us a pathway. Thank you for giving us guardrails. Help me to live those out that my city might experience your goodness. In Jesus' name.